This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Citizens united, Americans divided. The State of the Union, the State of Unions. Elections 2012, America at a crossroad. Here to talk about election 2012, the State of the Union and the State of Unions, is Mike Fishman, president of Local 32 BJ of the Service Employees International Union and the recently elected executive vice president of the International Union. 32 BJ is the largest private sector union in New York City and the country's largest property service union, representing more than 120,000 property service workers in eight states. SEIU represents 2.2 million workers in over 100 occupations in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada. It is the fastest growing union in the country with over 150 branches. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you, Doug. Good to be here. Congratulations. Well deserved. Thank you. Let's talk a bit about SEIU. You turned 32 BJ around. It was in the trusteeship, and you came in and made it a political powerhouse in New York. You're elected executive vice president. When do you take office, and what do you do? Well, I, get, I take office in October. I'm actually in office now, but I don't leave the local until October 3rd. And why, why October 3rd? There's an election in September, uh, September at 20th. 32 BJ. At 32 BJ. And then uh, the new uh, president will take over October 3rd. Okay, talk about SEIU as a union and your role in that union. I mean, SEIU is a huge union. It's the largest in the country, 2.2 million members uh, in three basic fields of work, uh, health care, public employees, and in property service, like our local. Mm -hmm. um, the union has been growing, as you said, fastest growing union every year, and representing its members. And we bring that power to bear to do good for working families around the country. And I'm going to be glad to be part of the team, now led by Mary Kay Henry as president, who just got elected, right. uh, be part of her team to lead the union. What do you do? What, well, what, what is your portfolio as executive vice president? She and I will be talking about that as I make a transition out of 32BJ. But really, I'm going to be going down to do the same kinds of things I've done at 32BJ, to help build the union, to bring workers together, to bring our strength to bear on political um, campaigns, and to build the power for working people to make changes in the country. Uh, last time we talked, we had the, the uh, Crane's New York headline, The Fishman right. Effect which talked about your ability to work with large numbers of people across political ideologies be, uh, beyond personal and institutional interest. Given the climate in the country, is that possible now? I think it is. It, nothing has changed, in my view, of our ability to have that same kind of effect. And I would say you know, that, that, as I said then, the Fishman effect was really about the strength of our union. It was really about the way our union functions and the, the role that our members play in New York and, and in every state we're in, that they're part of the fabric and that we use our strength together to help build a better city. And that means everybody succeeds, not just us, but we want the people who own the buildings, who lead the city, also to succeed. Is this, does this, will you have enough time to influence what might be happening on the national level prior to the November elections? You know, I don't think what I do specifically will right. make a difference, but the union as a whole will, of course, be a player in the national politics. Talk, and about, are now. talk, talk about how they play and what role they'll play. Well, the 2.2 million workers who are members of 30, uh, SEIU will be playing a role in the political debate, will be playing a role in shaping the political debate and in getting the vote out in November. Um, we have, as you know, every worker in this country has a great amount at stake in this coming presidential election okay, and in the states and in uh, Congress. Okay, let's get there. Let's yeah. talk about Scott Walker and the 2012 elections. When yeah. we last talked, it was in February, right. and this was still an ongoing situation, and we obviously didn't know the outcome. Now we know the outcome. 
Walker won the recall election, and Wisconsin has taken on almost mythic proportions. It's not only a real place, but it's a metaphor. What, what lesson or lessons can be drawn from this recall election? I mean, I think we have to go take a couple steps back. And I would say, first of all, you know, uh, I lived in Wisconsin 15 years. Right. So I'm uh, very familiar with the landscape of Wisconsin. The same state that gave us Joe McCarthy gave us Bob La Follette. You know, one of the best and talking about political most progressive. Schizophrenia, yeah. but go ahead. And that's Wisconsin. There's all kinds of debate that goes on. It's a the state with different tendencies and different constituencies. And in this case, this was a governor who took on uh, collective bargaining, who tried to move a right agenda, and the state erupted uh, against him. And there was a fight, as you know. Uh, this uh, this recall election, which was an incredibly difficult thing to do, was an attempt to push him back, and it did push him back. Whether he won or not. There was a fight that took place, and he won the vote to maintain his seat, but he's up for election again in a couple of years. And this was a, a, a recall attempt, which is very difficult, but an offensive move by the people who were upset with him. And so, to me, it's not, uh, you know, it's clearly being played in the press as a total defeat for the unions. I don't see it that way. Working people stood up. They had a fight. They didn't win this battle, but there'll be another battle. Okay. And remember, Go ahead. the Senate turned over, turned Democrat. Uh, the last election, the senator lost, the Republican, Democrats took over. It won't make a big difference because there's an election coming up sure. again, but we'll see what happens. Okay. Now, was this election a microcosm of the national race, or was it a result of political cross-currents unique to Wisconsin, or was it both? I think it's both. I don't think it's a, it's a mandate or a model for what's going to happen to President Obama. I think of President Obama... Is a, is a different debate than the debate that took place in Wisconsin. But I do think the debate in Wisconsin is one that's raging in this country, which is what's our country going to look like? What role does government play? And what I would say is we're now at least getting to the right debate. The debate is not about and should not be about competitiveness. That is, are we competitive with the rest of the world? Because that debate only ends with workers taking a wage cut. If you want to be competitive with the workers in China, then it means you make 50 cents an hour. But the debate is now about income inequality, and that's where we should be focused. Now, that's the, the division that's taken place. Now, the question the is, uh, is, that, is that the division, or is that the division that you hope to be, you know, actually be part of the message? I think that's the underlying division and the underlying debate that's taken place in the country. What kind of country do we want? You've got to remember that there's never been a time when the country wasn't divided. Right. You know, I just was reading about World War II when Franklin Roosevelt ran for his third term. Right. And he barely got elected That's in the exactly middle of the right. war. Ag you know? Against Wendell Wilkie, yeah. yes. In the middle of the war, and there was this giant d division in the country. There's always a division in democracy. That's not bad. And then we have a vote, and then a majority wins, and we move on. So it's not the division that bothers me. It's the question of what is our country going to look like? And I think that's what we have to talk about. So, I mean, this election in many ways is a crossroads election because essentially you're arguing that what we've got is a conflict between competing visions of America, both what it is and what it ought to be. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, but I do think that these are ongoing battles. There's crossroads you come to, but then the road goes on. You can take another path. And so in this debate, it's a question of what kind of country do we want? And I would say, you know, when we talk about government, one side would say we want a small government. Government is too big, too bureaucratic. It doesn't need to do what it does. I would say we want a government that works and works for people in this country where everybody can succeed. And that means rethinking what government should do and then funding it appropriately. You know, if we can't have services like fire, police, you know, national defense unless we pay for it. And so we have to come up with a financing mechanism, a tax revenue scheme that is equitable for everybody and finances the services we want. So we want tax increases? We have to decide what we want to pay for and then pay for it. And so if we want health care, if we want Medicare, if we want Social Security, we have to pay for it. We, okay. should not, we should not make believe that we can do those things without paying for it. Okay. You and I have both been around six, since the 60s in Vietnam. I don't know. I can't quite remember that. Well, well excuse me. <laughs> you, you should remember. In your mind, are we, as Doug Schoen's, the title of Doug Schoen's book, Hopelessly Divided, are we divided more profoundly than any time, at least since the 60s? 
I, I don't I don't put it in those in that I don't see it that way. I mean, you know, my limited reading of history, there's always been a division in the country. I'll go back to what I said about Roosevelt, but go back even further to the Civil War, after the Civil War, there's always been a division. There was one time in the, I think it was the 1890s, there was the Do Nothing Party. And the oh, no, you're yeah, right. Right. Well, and the Know Nothing Party. Know Nothing Party. You had the Know yeah. no, no, Nothing Party. 1850s. 1850s, okay. And, you know, this was, the debate was almost the same. It was about immigrants and immigrants coming to this country and who should be allowed here. We always have a division because we're a country that allows different points of view. And so we have to work through that. We have to work through it together. What are, in your mind, and perhaps in the union's mind, if you can speak for the union, are the dominant issues mm -hmm. confronting the country? Yeah, so I'll go back to the issue of income inequality. Okay. I think if you define the problem as in income inequality, then unions are part of the solution. Okay, that explain. Workers, okay. If, if the issue that we talk about all the time, and the White House has a Council on Competitiveness, if, if the issue that we think is the problem causing the economic stagnation here is competition, then again, the only solution to that is lower wages, go global, you know, move your company wherever you need to to make profits. But if the issue for America is, are we going to have a society where everybody can succeed and income equality is in the way of that, then the solution is, having some standard of wages that people can survive on in this country. And that means unions have to be part of that solution. We're the only effective way to really have a dialogue with companies to build an uh, equitable system of pay. And it, and it also seems that the, the union's message or argument is that unions built the middle class. Mm -hmm. The middle class is declining as unions are declining. Is there any prospect of the resurgence of the union movement. I mean, clearly it's been in decline in terms of overall numbers and apparently in its influence. Yeah, I think that unions, union growth has never been a trickle at a time. It's always been by spurts. And I think the time will come when workers will say, we need a way to raise our standards and there has to be a balance in society. And, the, and one of the ways to do that is to have a union. Uh, there's other ways to do it, but there will be a movement at some point to raise standards for workers. And, what I would say bluntly is what's happened with the decline of the middle class is our children have no future. Our children don't have a, a path to a, a better future. And what's always made America great is us feeling, people who come here from another country, like my father came here and gave me a future, is that there was a path to a better future. So, I mean, you're talking about some kind of loss of trust on the part of the American people, if you can generalize, yep. both in the American dream and also in the institutions of, of governance. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there is a sense that there's not a path forward and that there needs to be a reestablishment of trust that this country is about building a future for our kids and a path to being uh, a better life. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, me and working people, our members, they don't care that people get rich. Everybody would like to be rich. That's what the lottery is about. I'd like to have a path to be rich, but you want to be able to have a decent life without going down that path, and that you want to have some understanding that the, the society is going to give everybody a chance to succeed. Okay. And that's what we've lost. So oh. the sense of trust, yeah, I think, and I would add one more thing. Go ahead. Fear, you know, in this economy, when people are out of work, 10% unemployment, there's a fear for what's going to happen in the future, and that pits everybody against each other. Okay, let's let let's be more let's let's focus more a little bit on uh, uh, Walker, Wisconsin, and mm -hmm. public pensions. Yeah. It seems by you know just reading as much you know a, as I have that there were real issues with long-term spending obligations for pensions for retirement benefits among the states. I mean, the states have these huge obligations, and if the trend lines continue, it's going to choke them. What, what, how, did, how do you deal with this problem? It's a real problem. Yeah, I think it is a real problem. But you have to start with where did the problem come from? Go ahead. It came from two sources. One, underfunding of the pensions in previous years. So for political reasons, a state or a city did not pay in their pension. I live in one, New Jersey. Yeah. Thank you. And so they underfunded it. They put no contributions into the fund. That's not the workers' fault. And the second is the massive decline in the stock market in 2008. And so all these funds that were built on an assumption of re getting a return on their investments lost that return, lost those assets, and then they didn't fund it. And so all of a sudden, you could see it as a cliff, you know, the, the, the need for money goes up and those assets go down. 
And that, that is the real problem today. Yeah, but so, now that we've fallen off the cliff, how, yeah, do, we, how do we climb I back think, up? I think we have to, this is where people need to sit down together and figure out a solution. And it may be a better long-term funding mechanism. It may be, and there have been some adjustments in the pension benefits, you know, when public employee unions and uh, their members have sat down and worked out something with the state or with the city, those things are being done. But we have to start with the recognition first we have to address income and uh, retirement security. Right. There has to be a way for people to retire. Social Security does not do that. You know, our members, when they retire, get an average of $14,400 a, a year to live on. How can you live on Social Security alone? You can't. And that's true for public workers, too. And so we have to figure out a, a real solution to income and security, uh, retirement security. And then we have to address the actual financial issues in each state and each city. And yeah, of course there's a real cliff here that we're facing. And of course we have to find a solution together. And that may mean revenue increase. We have to figure that out. Okay, I mean, one possibility is revenue increases. Yep. I mean, you could grandfather uh, benefits to people of a certain age, hopefully older than I am, let's say 45. For everybody but each of one of us. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, you could increase the retirement age. You could reduce future commitments. There's a lot of mechanisms without going to the extreme, for example, of a Walker or a Kasich Absolutely. or a Scott. Absolutely. And, and we've seen those solutions uh, in many different places in many states. We saw it here. There was a discussion about they're on to tier six in New York. But there, most of that was done with the agreement and uh, discussion with the unions and with the workers. Well, we Cuomo did that. it differently than his Republican gubernatorial mm -hmm. counterparts mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Indiana, Ohio, yep. and uh, And in Michigan. Connecticut, they worked it out. That in Connecticut, they worked it out. Maybe yeah. it's a Northeast thing yeah. <laughs> that we're more rational. What, what maybe, is it? Or maybe that unions have more power here, so there can be yeah, a rational that, well, discussion. Yeah, okay. What lessons... Did, did you take away or could be learned from the events in Wisconsin? I mean, it's yeah. widely perceived that the union ground game just couldn't match. And it was an excellent ground game. It turned out more voters than it did mm -hmm. in 2008. But you lost. You. Yeah. Unions lost. What, what lessons are there? Yeah, well, I would start by saying the people of Wisconsin lost. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and that the unions were helping to spearhead the fight. Um, but I would say we saw a huge amount of money coming in from outside as a result of Citizens United, 10 to 1 advantage in money. I think it was $45 million. Yeah, it was something it's like $40 million to $3.9 million. Yeah, dollars. Um, I mean, unbelievable. And money. a lot of this, that money came from out of state. Yeah, it's always interesting when you see an article that says, well, unions sent some people in to the state to work. Well, we send in a few people to help out, you know, our brothers and sisters, uh, and but forty million dollars comes in from out of state for the Walker side, and that's money coming from big corporations, you know, almost an unlimited amount of money, and that's dangerous for our country. That's what I would say. So not only does money talk, but money shouts. Yeah, money shouts. That's and good then, way to put it. and then I guess the second lesson that could be drawn from that is that the ground war can't counter the air war and the air war being the product of all this? You know, money? I think it's, I think it's, it's um, every case is different. Go ahead. You know, in some places, the ground war can counter the air war. Depends on the messaging and depends on how, how much people are divided and depends on people's strength of feeling on the issue. On the other hand, money does make a difference. It buys the ground war and it does buy a message on the air and, and it buys a negative campaign and that, Changes people's minds. Okay, let's let's yeah. let's talk about negative campaigning. And uh, another lesson is, go ugly and go ugly early and keep being ugly. I mean, I think that, you know, this is a debate that politicians, campaigners have all the time about going negative and what the effect is. And clearly, going negative has an effect. It it, it changes people's minds. And right. It, and but it, it doesn't depress turnout. It didn't. Sometimes turn, it, didn't, it does. This it time didn't it didn't do it in this election. Didn't do it in this election. And and also, it's not necessarily the truth. You know what they what is said in a negative ad. Sometimes it's it's usually part of the truth or it's part not quite true. Yeah, but if and, you look at some of the academic, but it's not new. It's yeah, not, that's right. You no, know, when Abraham Lincoln was running, they put negative ads out on him. <laughs> well, come on. I mean, you know, there were there was plenty of it's plenty of skinny wrong guy with, this was, guy. You know, with a high guy. pitched voice. Come yeah. on. Right. Also, another, another sort of lesson that it seems to me came out of this is that there really is class warfare 
and it's begun. And it's sort of as Warren Buffett said, you know, there is class warfare, and I'm on, I'm, I'm on, I'm in the class that's part of it, and I'm we're winning. <laughs> I mean, is that another lesson that comes out of, of Wisconsin? Is there, is there, was there a class issue involved in this as well? I think there's always a class issue, and it, it comes, it came out in Occupy Wall Street in uh, talking about the one percent and the ninety-nine percent, but it's really about who has power in this country and who has control, and and what's the effect of that, you know. It wouldn't matter if the people who had the money who were in control and were sharing it with everybody. It's, it's a question of the equality of sharing in the country. And if the people, the 99%, are not getting their fair share and have no future to get that, their fair share, then there's real warfare going on. But wait a second. Yep. But, but, you know, if, the, if there's the 99% against the 1%, how come the election is going to be so close? Yeah, you know, it, it is. Because part of that 99% sort of is voting against its own interests? That's true. I mean, I think that's true. And, and the issues are always a little unclear. In a race with Scott Walker, the, the, the issue was, does, do public employees, does public employee, uh, employee getting a retirement uh, security and getting health benefits and costing the taxpayers money mean that the state will be less competitive and therefore there'll be fewer jobs? I mean, that's sort of the rap that was out there, right? Okay, yes. So, but to me, it's not private sector worker against a public sector worker. It's, it's what's going to be good for the country as a whole and for all workers. And they pitted public workers and private workers against each other. But, and people sometimes vote against their own interests. But the truth of the matter is that it's in everyone's interest to have an economy that works for all. Okay. You bring up the point about pu uh, public unions and private unions. When we talk about unions, or a lot of time the conversation about unions, is that they're monolithic and clearly they're not. The different unions have really different institutional mm -hmm. interests and different membership interests as well. And does, is, th is that part of the weakening of, the, of, of, of unions, that there seems to be this centrifugal element going on, you know, driving I mean, them apart? It's a complicated equation, again, because remember that public workers organize after private sector workers. Right. Private sector workers organize in this country, and because private sector workers, you know, take Wisconsin, Michigan, auto workers organize, Janesville, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the big factories there, they won pensions, they won health care, and then public workers organized. Right. They organized into unions to win the same benefits supported by the private sector right. workers. Now we've seen... Private sector unionism in this country is down to 7%. Right. Only s 7 out of 100 workers are in unions. Unbelievable. 93 out of 100 are not. And generally, those who are not don't have pension, don't have health care. And so here they are, and the public workers, they're paying their taxes, have pension, have health care. And the, the discussion becomes, well, why should they have it instead of me? When the truth of the matter is, we should reverse the discussion and say, we want public workers to have income security, retirement security. And we want them to health care, and we want the same, and we have to rebuild that. So there's an artificial fight going on, an artificial distinction. And our view, you know, our union, 32BJ, building service workers, private sector, right. we want to support those who are working in the public sector. We want the people who are supported by our taxes to make decent wages, to have good health care. Okay. President Obama, you know, tunes in on the show and says, this guy Fishman, yeah. he's really good. <laughs> what advice, I, you know, have him come in, let me, you know, sit down with him. So you're sitting in, you know, in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, just you and him. What do you tell him? I tell him, talk to the American people. Tell them that we want to build a country where everybody wins, not just one piece. Specifically? I'd say, talk to the American people and, and build a country where people work together, but pe everybody wins. And that means drive a hard agenda with Congress. Don't, don't take a back seat. Drive you know, continue to fight for health care, continue to fight for a better uh, retirement system. These are the things that people really need. And give workers more rights to be able to uh, support themselves and fight for themselves. What, what specific policies might you suggest to the president? Uh, I would say infrastructure investment. Right now, our economy is in trouble. We need to create jobs. Jobs would be number one, two, and three. Okay. It's been that way for the last four years. What we about need... immigration? Immigration... We should be figuring out a way for the 12 million who are here to get amnesty, to be able to stay here. Immigration helps this country. We need to find a home for everybody. And then we have to address the issue of future flow. But he's taken a step in the right direction with his uh, issue on uh, children being here and getting support for them while they're here. Okay. Let's, let's, let's move locally. Yep. 
Uh, last Sunday, there was the silent march on Stop and Frisk. 299 mm -hmm. organizations. We were there. Uh, B, uh, BJ, 32 BJ was there. Talk about the march and the significance of the march and the significance of the issue. I think, first of all, the march was very powerful. Um, 20,000 people in the street. It's quiet. unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it was a, whoever made that decision, I wasn't part of it, but to have a silent march really sent a strong message. We shouted louder by being silent. Sure. And I think, you know, from talking to our members in the black community and the Latino community, it is um, a terrifying experience to be in a community where any, especially men, stopped on the street for walking down there, uh, takes away your dignity, you know, just to check and see whether you have a weapon. You just get stopped. Uh, I know some of our members of our executive board have been stopped two or three times. 50-year-old men doing nothing wrong. It takes away their dignity. It terrifies the parents of children who are on the street. And, you know, our, our city has been a safe city. Uh, but when a policy to create safety creates fear, you have to address that policy and you have to change it. And that's where we're at now. I think this is a policy that... Uh, was created to create a safe environment. Instead, it's creating an environment of fear, and that has to be changed. And I think the message was loud and clear. We have to we have to change it. Okay. Well, I mean, we have 30 seconds. <laughs> You're optimistic, and why? Well, I'm optimistic because I think people in this country are smart. People will do the right thing. People will fight for their rights, and we can make a difference. Uh, I believe that in You're not this, being naive. I'm not. Okay. I, I do, I, I've seen it myself. Our union has been successful, not by doing any tricks, but by talking to our members, talking to workers, taking on the fights that need to be done, but also working to create a, a city, and in the states we work, where everybody can succeed. And I think you started by talking about the Fishman effect. I think that that's really about what we do together and that we believe we all have to succeed and we can do that uh, if we have the dialogue. Okay. You're going to come back after the election, and we're going to do a post-mortem? Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to Mike Fishman for being on the show. Join us next week when we talk about the Middle East with former U.S. Ambassador to Syria and Saudi Arabia, Richard Murphy, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.